Benji, let me start off by asking you about your famous book on Franz Kafka. I have to admit, I'm sorry I have not read it yet. I'm sorry for myself, not for you, by the way. <laughs> I, I know, but it's, it's, it's worldwide fame, and I have friends who've read it and speak very highly about it. So uh, I thought that'd be a good place to start. Tell, tell me about the background, what the book is about. The book is called Kafka's Last Trial, and it begins with a courtroom setting at the Israeli Supreme Court chambers in the summer of 2016. And that stick that there was a very unusual, uh, unusual treasure, you might say, and that is the manuscripts of Franz Kafka, which were rescued by his best friend, Max Brod in 1939 and brought in a suitcase from uh, Prague on the last day that it was possible to leave German occupied Prague and to and rescue to Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv was the only place that gave refuge to Max Brod and, and his wife. And this begins this very strange and you might say Kafkaesque tale uh, in which I sort of um, trace three, uh, you might say a triangle of interests that came to a head in the courtroom that day. There was the National Library of Israel who said basically this material is cultural uh, treasure of the Jewish people. It belongs in the National Library in Jerusalem. There was the equivalent of the National Library in Germany. It's called the Marbach Liter Literatur Archiv. And it already had priceless Kafka manuscripts. And its argument was that, of course, Kafka died in 1924, never stepped foot in Israel, was not a Zionist, unlike Max Brod, and belongs by virtue of the fact that he wrote in German. He belongs firmly in the canon of, of German modern literature. And the third um, element that, that uh, came to the court was the private family um, to whom Max Broad, who didn't have children, entrusted these priceless manuscripts called the Hoffa family, who felt that um, both sides were sort of representing an incursion uh, of public national ideological claims into the realm of the private. And thus began a trial which brought to the fore this incredible fraught history, charged history between Israel and Germany, um, specifically and ironically with regard not just to any writer, but to a writer who himself was so ambivalent about belonging. Mm -hmm. And uh, who, of course, was not a German citizen. He lived all of his life in Prague, who was also not, a, um, <clears throat> not a, as I mentioned, a Zionist, but who, of course, studied Hebrew intensively at the end of his life, who uh, studied Yiddish literature, writes about Yiddish theater, and um, I set out to tell that story. And it's essentially the, the story of the afterlife of Kafka's legacy and how that afterlife brought to the boil all these um, tensions under the surface. Well, it sounds like it's a story of, of identity. In other words, the oldest problem of Jewish identity, at least since the uh, first exile, um, is, what is what exactly is a Jew? Is a Jew a national category? Is a Jew a religious category? So I guess that's that's the issue with with Zionism, right? Whether if the if the state of Israel is claiming Kafka as their own, so that's making a very strong statement about what it is to be a, an Israeli vis-a-vis -vis being a Jew and vice versa. It also makes a strong statement about certain assumptions vis-a-vis -vis diaspora culture, which is to say, um, we are claiming that. Jerusalem is the proper culmination, you might say, for a story that began elsewhere. Mm -hmm. In other words, a story that ended with the uh, untimely and early death of Franz Kafka in 1924, but somehow um, belongs properly in Jerusalem. In other words, in the court, the, the, the lawyers for the National Library were essentially making a claim that Jerusalem is not just about ingathering of exiles, but also ingathering of material culture in that sense. It also played um, a role with regard not just to diaspora culture in general, but to German language diaspora Jewish culture uh, and the ambivalence, as I don't have to tell you, towards that culture, especially in the early years of the state, where both German and Yiddish languages were actively suppressed. So therefore, there was an ambivalence toward German writers, towards Max Brod himself, the whole second half of his life, who lived in, in Tel Aviv and wrote there. Um, so, yeah, it raises these very interesting questions also about how this Germany is, um, is to its own past. In other words, it was very convenient for Germany that they're, they're pointing to a Jew, a Jewish author, 
pre-war as if to point to the you know uh, the famous German Jewish dialogue that Gershom Sholom so actively refused to countenance um, but it was very convenient for the Germans to do this as well from their own from their own point of view and I must tell you an anecdote about exactly this I was interviewing the director of, of the Marbach archive it's right outside of Stuttgart it's got the, the treasures of German language literature. So it's really a question of who will be the posthumous neighbors of Franz Kafka. Will they be, as in, if he ends up in the National Library, people like Scholem and Martin Buber and Shmuel Hugo Bergman and Max Broad, or on the other hand, if he resides at Marbach, his neighbors will be Heidegger and people like this. Um, so I went to Marbach to interview the director who's uh, prominent you know German public intellectual on, on his own right and we're speaking about uh, the question of whether in this in today's digital age where it actually matters where manuscripts physically reside and he said to me something astonishing he said in this case it actually does matter because if Kafka's legacy ends up in Jerusalem Kafka will be read and interpreted in a narrow sense as only a Jewish writer if on the other hand he ends up here in Germany, he'll end up being read in the most universalistic sense as a you know, European humanist. And I thought to myself, that's just an amazing thing for a German to say uh, a couple of generations after, after the Shoah. By the way, a Shoah which, um, in which all three of Kafka's sisters were murdered. Um, and it made me think about how to uh, understand a legal case. Why did you think it was astonishing? Why exactly? I thought it was astonishing to um, perpetuate this notion that somehow the Jews have in narrow interests, whereas mm. we, the Germans, if we have interests at all, we're interested only in, in uh, European culture per se. Right. Um, and uh, I thought it, it just demonstrated an amazing sort of lack of, of uh, recognition. I have to say that just as I'm kind of thinking about, about this with you, I'm reminded of a wonderful image that the writer Cynthia Ozick uh, writes about in which she says that literature in essence is like a shofar. If you blow on the wide end, which is in other words, metaphorically the universal end, no sound will come out. The, the shofar resounds only if you blow through the narrow end, which is to say through the most particular. Only through the particular can you reach the universal. You very seldom reach the particular by beginning with the universal. So uh, this whole conversation with the director of the Marbach archive made me think of, okay, well, if you begin with the assumption that Kafka belongs to us all, um, then you end up in a very different place than the Israeli assumption in this court case, which is, well, you have to begin with a particular, you have to understand that Kafka was uh, deeply Jewish in his, in his essence. And uh, although, by the way, although, although he, and this is something that came out on the trial, although uh, in, no, in nowhere in Kafka's fiction does he um, explicitly mention uh, the word Jew, um, precisely because of that fact, uh, you might read his his uh, his writing as so deeply and essentially Jewish. Uh, what is the particular in Kafka's in Kafka's case? Is it that he was a a Czech German speaking Jew, or is it or is it that he's a Jew who happens to speak German and happens to live in Prague? Well, one way of talking about his particularity is to understand Kafka as. Uh, triply marginalized, which is to say he and his closest friend Max Brod both um, belonged to the Czech minority within the Austro-Hungarian majority. Within that, they belonged to the German-speaking minority within the Czech minority. And within that, they belonged to the Jewish minority within the German-speaking minority within the Czech minority within the Austro-Hungarian context. So marginality is itself um, something that can be read as deeply particularistic. Um, and uh, what do you think? What, what, what's your private opinion here? What is the Kafka esque essence? Is it a Jewish essence? Is it, a, is it impossible to define? I think that Kafka represents a very interesting case in which um, a deeply a Jewish, Jewish identity can be somehow insulated from and separated from a nationalistic belonging. So he was very wary of nationalistic belonging. Max Broad had to sort of literally 
kind of drag him to hear Martin Buber when Martin Buber gave three famous lectures in, in Prague about, about cultural Zionism. He had to drag him into uh, certain uh, Zionist circles against Kafka's will. Um, in that sense, Kafka did have a very ambivalent relationship with belonging. On the other hand, he his art is, is to my mind, so deeply Jewish um, insofar as it investigates the modern sense of mar marginality um, in the sense of also a negotiation with the father. So one of Kafka's famous, most famous texts is not a short story at all, but it's his letter to the father, which the father actually never read, a 60 page uh, letter, which is actually now part of this ar archive that we're talking about today, um, in which he sort of, in which Jew the Jewishness plays a central role in the sense that his father was an assimilated German speaking Jew. And Kafka says, you pass down nothing of depth to me, worse than nothing, because it was so empty. And this, is, this explains Kafka's late in life turn to Eastern European and Yiddish modes of very rich Jewishness. Um, he lived at the end of his life with a woman named Dora Diamant, who herself was from a Hasidic family, and they read they read Hebrew texts together, they read Talmud together. Um, so, in that sense, Kafka almost you, you might also speculate about whether Kafka perfected German as a Jewish language. Mm -hmm. Hebrew Hebrew is not the only Jewish language. It's possible to write in diasporic languages, and if one is powerful enough a writer. To, to transform those languages into Jewish languages. And that's the way I would put it. That's nice, I like that. I always, I mean, I'll tell you my, my feeling. I, I love Kafka, I adore Kafka. And I've always felt that, that he was a deeply Jewish writer, um, even without being religious, you know, in the typical sense of the, of the term, that he was actually not just Jewish, but, but that he really is a religious writer. He's specifically connected to the Talmud to the Torah, even without mentioning those things, but just the cast of mind and the way the, the way he experiences reality in a, in a dark way, obviously. But to me, it's always struck me as very Jewish and very funny, very, very comedic. I don't know. A lot of people I, I find Kafka difficult to stomach because they think he's dark. But to me, it's I, I would say I, I'd like to know what your, your thoughts are on this. I, I to me, he's one of the he's somebody whose humor is so dry. He's perfected the art of dry humor to such a such a, an intense degree of dryness that it's no longer recognizable as humor. But nevertheless, it is humor. You know, if you if, if I feel like you, if you don't read Kafka and you don't start cracking up, then I think there's something wrong. I don't know. I don't know. That's, what that's a nice way to put it. I, and I think that um, you know Max Broad was usually the first audience when Kafka was reading drafts of his stories. And I think it was his breakthrough story, which is called The Judgment, which Kafka wrote over Erev Yom Kippur, over a single night, and which is very Jewish in the sense of, um, of, the, fa of the father being the judge and the son being the, the judged and the self-judged and the themes of shame, etc. But anyway, I think it's, it's with respect to that story that... Um, that Max Broad says that when Kafka was reading it, he couldn't even finish reading it, a draft of it to Max Broad because he was laughing so much. <laughs> I'm actually sitting, joining you today at the Van Leer Institute where um, uh, Jacques Derrida in the 1980s came here and gave a very famous lecture on Kafka's parable called Before the Law. And that's a very deeply Talmudic text, uh, in my opinion, maybe the most Jewish text that Kafka ever wrote. But um, because, of course, it relates to the uh, unattainability of the law. But in any case, uh, a friend of mine who came to that lecture here at Van Leer told me that there was it was obviously packed. And he sat in the last row next to an old woman who had a walker and, and he offered to help her uh, walk home. On the way, it turns out that she, her name is Pua Menzel Bentovim. And at age 19, she traveled from Jerusalem to Prague to be, um, to study mathematics, but at the same time, she was teaching Kafka Hebrew. And uh, that's just an incredible way of, of you know, um, uh, completing the circle. But to complete the circle even more, in this batch of manuscripts that we're talking about today are many um, things that were never seen before. One of those things is a, letter written in fluent Hebrew that Kafka writes to Pua. 
in which um, he apologizes for not doing his homework that week. And the last line of the letter is something like, please don't be angry at me. I'm angry enough for the two of us. <laughs> That's great. Well, tell me, what, what, what happened in the end with this uh, trial? What was the... Is that... In the end, um, <laughs> Justice Eliakim Rubinstein wrote the, uh, the verdict. It was a panel of three judges, as is often the case here. And uh, I'll say one more thing before, I, I, before the spoiler alert, which is that as this trial went on through the various three le levels of the Israeli judicial system, each verdict, and there were three of them, uh, was, very, was written with great literary flourish. Uh, I think that the judges knew that their text would be read. And this, to me, uh, encouraged me in my book to read the verdicts as if they were texts of literary interpretation and to understand the judges as if they were gatekeepers of Kafka interpretation. Because as you started to say, it's not the, on one level, and this is something I realized when I was sitting in the courtroom in 2016, on one level, it was a very legalistic uh, debate. And it had to do with an interpretation of one clause of Max Broad's will. Okay, but beneath the surface, there was also a debate about, well, what, what kind of writer is Kafka? Is Kafka essentially a Jewish writer or essentially a, a German writer? So it was a question of identity, and that meant that you had to be, the, the, the judges were put in the position, perhaps uncomfortably, of being interpreters, right? Literary interpreters. So that's sort of how I got the idea, and this goes back to your first question, to write the whole book. Anyway, in 2016, the last of these verdicts, which run to 50 or 60 pages, they're just marvelous documents, uh, was issued by Eliakim Rubinstein, in which he uh, sided with the claims of the National Library here in Jerusalem, that all of Kafka's, all of Max Broad's estate, including the Kafka material, um, must go to the National Library. It was structured in such a way that the owner, uh, whose name was Chava Hofe, didn't get any compensation whatsoever. She was, of course, devastated by this. Um, and uh, the papers were in three locations, two, one in her apartment on Spinoza Street, as it happens, in Tel Aviv, that she shared with Kafka's manuscripts and about a dozen cats, another a bank vault in Tel Aviv, and a third a bank vault in Zurich, Switzerland. So it took, after 2016, being a Kafka story, it's never finished, right? So it took all these secondary um, cases, and uh, finally, all this material is now here in Jerusalem. It's being poured through as we speak, uh, so it's not complete. Eventually, it will be digitized for all of us to see, but it, it will promise, I think, to shed new light on this wonderful and, and very unique friendship between Max Broad, who was a writer, a very prolific writer in his own right, and, and Kafka. And um, it's an amazing treasure trove of, of uh, cultural heritage. Let's, uh, let's switch uh, topics here. I'd like to know, I'm very excited, by the way, to, that you're coming to the Ashkenazium. Uh, you're obviously going to be talking about Kafka and about uh, Bruno Schultz. Right? Those are going to be the two foci that you're going to be focusing on. So uh, to tell me, just in general outline, what, what your ideas are for this course. The idea is um, to introduce modern, uh, let's say, diasporic forms of, of Jewish writing through the figures of Franz Kafka and Bruno Schulz, which is to say two figures who wrote in their respective national languages, Kafka in German and Schulz in Polish. Each one is considered by their host countries to, to belong to them, so to speak, to belong to German and Polish modernist literature respectively. And yet each was deeply Jewish. Uh, they were roughly contemporaries. Bruno Schulz, um, unlike Kafka, lived a bit longer and he was killed by uh, an SS officer um, in 1942. <clears throat> well, buying and, a loaf of bread, no? Well, going out to buy yes, a loaf of bread. Yes, he had just he had just uh, he had just purchased the loaf of bread that he was bringing back to his family. And um, there are certain commonalities that we can you know discuss between them, but among the other commonalities is a dispute over um, memory which is to say, who are the proper custodians of European Jewish memory? Um, who has the right to guard Jewish memory in a place where Jews no longer live, 
Mm. Um, I um, this is so this is so to the point of the existence of the Ashkenazium. <laughs> it's the actual. I mean, it's 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 kind of paradoxical. I often talk to people about this, and that, that we're opening up an institute named Ashkenazim about Ashkenazi history and about Ashkenazi letters and and thinkers, and and yet it's located, ironically, it, it, historically, it's connected to you know, the glory of Ashkenaz, but by comparison today, it's relatively speaking, it's it's deserted. That's Chas Shalom, and I don't want to exaggerate that there are many Ashkenazim living here in Budapest. Yes, many, um, but I'm saying, relatively speaking, the you know the, the what we associate with Ashkenaz with with its glorious golden age, you know that's completely gone. Well, one way to think about it is the to, to think about the destruction of World War II, not just in terms of um, the death of of Jewish citizens, but also what it did to to the to the culture. Now, in the case of Prague and in, in, in with Kafka, in the case of Drohobych in uh, present day Ukraine with respect to that's Schulz's hometown, in both cases you had, they were both part of the multilingual, multi-ethnic uh, Austro-Hungarian empire. And if you look today, right, Poland, when Schulz was alive, he was living in greater Poland, was a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multilingual place, as much as Prague was in the interwar period of Kafka's great, great uh, creativity. And today, uh, I, I was just in Drohobych, today in November, um, Poland is mono-linguistic uh, and mono-ethnic and, and homogenous, right? It's a great loss. It's a great loss. Uh, even from the perspective of, the, of the, the host countries, let alone from the perspective of the Jewish communities in these places. Um, so that's one way to approach this question of um, Jewish writing uh, in, um, let's say, fluid boundaries, fluid European boundaries. The fluidity is very important for both of these, um, for both of these artists. Uh, and the, the last thing I'll say on the subject is that um, there's a parallel to the Kafka manuscript case in the Bruno Schulz case, which also raises profound questions of, of memory. And that is that um, Bruno Schulz was uh, uh, enslaved by an SS officer in his hometown and he was forced to paint. He was a, he was a great artist. And his last murals were uh, forgotten after he, after, he died, after he was killed in 1942. Uh, they were painted over, nobody knew about them, it, it, almost as a metaphor of his own legacy in his hometown. Nobody had heard, nobody. So to make a very long story short, uh, in 2001, three months after these murals of Bruno Schulz were rediscovered, Yad Vashem sent a secret team of three agents to this hometown in Durhobich and chiseled them off the wall and uh, in violation of, of certain national and international laws, spirited them back to Yad Vashem. Now, what was the defense of Yad Vashem? The defense is nobody cares about Schultz or about the Jewish Galician memory in the place of his hometown. Uh, we, have a, we assert a moral right as guardians of, of Jewish memory that this uh, cultural artifact will be preserved better here, will be displayed, more people can come see it, etc. Of course, the people in Drohobich took extreme offense at this act. And in a way, there is a parallel dispute, right? You can see yeah. that, that in both cases, they both raise these questions of who has a right to be the guardian of, um, of, of European Jewish memory and to whom is it convenient to cultivate that memory? It's, so, it's such a fascinating, fascinating question, really. I mean, you know, the, the heart of all of these problems is this, is this eternal Jewish question of, of of uh, Jewish identity. In other words, to what extent is Jewish identity defined by national borders, by linguistic borders? To what extent is being a Jew intrinsically cosmopolitan? I mean, even it has, and there's so many layers to this question. I mean, you're, you're in Yerushalayim right now, you're in Jerusalem, you're talking about uh, the heritage of Kafka, the heritage of Schultz, which, uh, which is being preserved in Yerushalayim. Um, and in a, in a sense, I mean, I, I would think that from a Jewish standpoint, Jerusalem is the epitome of cosmopolitanism. 
from a truly, and I'm talking here from a prophetic standpoint, from the, the way that Isaiah and Jeremiah saw Jerusalem. Jerusalem is not some parochial Jewish town. On the contrary, it's, it's the umbilicum of the universe, which means that it's connected intrinsically to all cultures, to all languages, uh, to all of humanity. And, and it, I just wonder to what extent these, that kind of argument played into, maybe if, if only subconsciously, you know, into, into this, uh, into the feeling that, that it's not, in other words, look, you can pose it two ways. You could say, we, you know, we are Jews, we are Zionists. As, as, as Jews in the Jewish homeland, we have a right to this stuff. It's ours as Jews, which, which could sound quite parochial. Or you could say, look, it's precisely as Jews that we are cosmopolitan, and that's why we're appropriating this stuff, specifically to give it its cosmopolitan setting. So it's not, not to give it, not to somehow hoard this material to ourselves. It reminded me of uh, a conversation that Gershom Sholom, the great scholar of Kabbalah, had about this question of the centrality of Jerusalem. And he said, he told his interlocutor, he said, in my opinion, Jerusalem is the center of the world, omphalum mundum, the very navel of the world. The Hebrew University is at the center, uh, of, culturally speaking, of Jerusalem, and I'm at the center of Hebrew University. <laughs> Listen, by, by the way, I, I want to ask you, I'll probably bug you more when you're here in Budapest about these types of questions, but I know there was a discussion about Kafka between Gershom Sholom and uh, Walter Benjamin. That, that somehow there was a challenge, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, Walter Benjamin challenged Sholem, or was it the other way around, to explain Kafka from a Kabbalistic standpoint? Yes, actually, in, in the correspondence between Sholem and Walter Benjamin, Kafka figures very prominently. Uh, and the um, Walter Benjamin has this notion that Kafka represents... Um, uh, Agada, the, the force of Agada, raising its mighty hand against Halakha. And Sholem, in, re, in reply, reads Kafka as someone who is profoundly preoccupied with transmissibility. That brings us back to the Jewishness of Kafka. In other words, with the question of how knowledge and learning is transmitted from one generation to the other, but he has a twist, which is to say, what happens when we have the Jewish habit, ingrained habit of transmissibility without the content, without what, what is actually transmitted? And he reads that as uh, essential to Kafka's art and essential to Kafka's modernist situation. And that brings us back to the letter to his father. And I'm sorry for the active background noise at this think tank, um, which is to say Kafka didn't inherit very much Jewishly, but he did inherit the instinct for transmission. And he's wondering, well, can you um, transmit can you, can you transmit something without fully having absorbed that content yourself? Mm. What is transmissibility? It, what is transmissibility in and of itself? So that's a, a very profound um, uh, correspondence on, on the question of Kafka that we can talk about also in the course. And they also criticized Max Broad because <clears throat> of course all these people knew each other and Max Broad was... Um, uh, the one who rescued Kafka, not just from himself, not just from his last instructions, and not just from the Nazis, but rescued Kafka from oblivion. And all of those years that he was living in Tel Aviv, from 1939 until Broad's death in 1968, he was devoted to the memory of his friend in a very selfless way. During that time, he wrote the first biography of Kafka in 1937, and so he, he was the first really to put his stamp on Kafka interpretation. And Benjamin and Sholem didn't think much of Broad's interpretation. They thought, in, in essence, he was too close to his subject, uh, and he painted uh, Kafka too much as a secular saint. Um, so that's part of what we can talk about when we talk about the reception in Israel of, uh, it's a very, very interesting question of how Kafka was received here. You know, one of the things that came up in the trial was that the Germans said, oh, many towns and villages and cities in Germany have at least one Kafka street. And, and uh, not a single city in Jerusalem has a Kafka street, which at the time was true. Uh, so they wanted to portray the Israelis 
as latecomers, so to speak, to uh, appreciation of, of Kafka. That was one of, their, of the strategies during the trial. And so that, that, that's also a question of how Israel appropriates diaspora cultures um, or doesn't appropriate. It's, it's a fascinating question. I mean, you know, one of the ways that we define messianic times is that the, the exiles will be ingathered. So it's interesting to take this into a kind of posthumous dimension and to say that not only are we gathering the living exiles, but also the dead. Everybody that's another thing that we will, we will be discussing in the course is how, not coincidentally, both of these writers uh, meditated on the question of messianism. Um, Schultz, at the time of his death, with that work on his magnum opus, it was a novel called The Messiah. This manuscript has been lost. There are indications that it still exists, perhaps in KGB archives that were taken over from the Gestapo archives. Um, and we're going to talk about messianism in the art of Schultz and messianism in the art of uh, Kafka, who writes a lot about messianism in his journals, um, specifically on the question of what happens when um, a message arrives too late. This is very, very uh, central to Kafka's concerns, I think. What happens when a message um, is vital, but it arrives just a moment after you can actually make use of it, or is garbled in transmission? Um, that's, I would say, a, a taste of, of how he treats the messianic question. Mm -hmm.